people it was a different time back then getting right. into it Definitely. you know i remember i can't remember who it was they started because they saw an ad in the newspaper looking for an apprentice puppeteer and they were like oh what's that i'll give it a go and here they are working on like star wars now it just doesn't happen like that anymore welcome back to puppeteers i'm your host adam krutinger and we have back again today cameron garrity hello everybody good to be here thanks today's, adam oh sure <laughs> today's a very special episode we have kate williams here hello kate hey guys Hey, so um, we'll just do a quick little rundown intro and uh, we'll, we'll get started. So, Adam, what I love about uh, Puppeteers is just how um, many different sort of styles and ways that you could get into the industry just working um, and doing all, all sorts of, of different types of things. Um, there are real puppeteers, puppeteers, of people who just do little odd jobs and their own stuff and professional work and all sorts of things. So um, what I'm really excited today is that we have um, Katie Williams on, who's done some really incredible stuff. Um, she has a great portfolio of personal work, as well as stuff that she's done with Ardman Studios on, on things like Early Man. She helped on Wes Anderson's uh, Isle of Dogs. And um, we're so excited to have her today. So Katie Williams, welcome to Puppet Tears. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so uh, what are you working on? Um, so at the moment, just the end of last week, I just finished working, uh, making puppets for a company called Dead Puppet Society, who are, um, they're actually an Australian company, but they're over in London at the moment, uh, bringing a show over that's going to be at the Natural History Museum. Um, so I've been helping them to make their puppets, all kinds of animal puppets for that show. So that's yeah, been great. Those are for live performances? Yeah, yeah. So it's um, the performance is called The Wider Earth, and it's about Charles Darwin and his um, voyage on the Beagle um, and all the animals that he kind of encounters on that voyage. And so all the animals are puppets, and yeah, I had a hand in sort of helping bring those puppets together. So oh, great. it was really great. Can you describe the, the, the style of them? Because I've been following it on, on your Instagram, and there's a really beautiful aesthetic to them. And I'm curious where that inspiration has come from. Um, so uh, the the company uh, came up with the designs uh, themselves and uh, it was actually out of sort of a, a practical sort of uh, way that they came about them. They were actually in, I think, New York at the time and they didn't have the capabilities to sort of make all the puppets they needed for the show and then ship them back to Australia. So they uh, learned how to draw everything up um, and get things laser cut just purely so that they could have everything designed and ready to go when they were back in Australia. So it kind of came out of a practical sort of way. And then the aesthetic has just also happened to work really well as well. And I think they came together really beautifully. Yeah, they look really handmade. Like it, it reminds me of, um, I don't know if they have these over here, but um, when you used to go to the zoo, they'd have these like wooden puzzles that came flat yes. and pop all the pieces out. Yes, and yeah. then you'd have like a giant lion by the end of it or whatever. So it's, yeah. it's a really great aesthetic. I like how simple they are as well. Like they're, you don't, I don't feel like you need to finish them perfectly so they look exactly like the animal. I think there's so much the audience can kind of get a hint at what the animal is with the little bits of kind of leather or bits of wicker that we've put on them. And it's just enough to kind of give you the idea of what the character would be. And then the audience uses their imagination to fill in the blanks, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So are you making those remotely from Bristol? No, so I was actually for the last three weeks based in London um, working actually in the museum, which was really great. They set up a sort of uh, open workshop there that um, so we'd be making and assembling and doing all the leather work and the wicker work in the workshop and then the public could actually come by and um, check in on the workshop and ask questions have a look at the puppets and watch us working which is really nice and very different for me normally I, I'm locked away in a workshop but it was nice to have people coming in and, and sort of being inspired by what we were doing and excited about the show so oh, did yeah. those puppets ship out yet? Uh, so they had shipped a whole bunch from Australia and then we made another new set here in, in the UK. So they've got kind of spares and bits of legs and arms and stuff. If, if things sort of break, they can kind of switch it out. So I think there's about, I'm guessing, about 30-ish puppets in, in total in the show. So quite a lot. And the show is going to be running for, I think, hopefully about six months. So they needed an extra sort of set just in case things break, so. 
<laughs> That's really cool. So what was it like to, uh, you, you mentioned how you, you're not used to really working around people. I, I could only imagine what sort of questions and things that you got as people are coming in and out of your workspace. So did you, you enjoyed that? Yeah, I did. Um, to start with, you kind of, because there was um, a, a glass or, um, wall screen that people could kind of watch from there, but they could also come inside and, and ask questions. And it was a little bit like being an animal, in a, an animal in a cage to begin with. And then you forgot about the people that were there after a while and you just got, got along with it. Um, we had some really interesting questions, lots of children coming in and, and being really amazed by, by the sort of puppets because we could pick them up and sort of show them, do a bit of puppeteering and, and show them the sort of, bringing them to life, which was really nice. Um, a few people came in and were just surprised that there was a job in, in making puppets, which was, I think, a really good way to kind of get people engaged in sort of our industry and aware that, yes, it is a job that, you know, if you're interested in art or making or anything like that, that you can sort of pursue. So it was really great in that way as well. That's very cool. Now, were any representatives from Dead Puppet Society there working with you guys or were they all like totally remote? No, so um, the two artistic directors of the company, um, Nick and David, uh, were in the room with us the whole time. So um, David designed the puppets himself um, and he was there sort of helping us put them all together. Um, and Nick was there as well um, as, as the producer, but also in the room and uh, informing people of what the show was about when they came around. And so they were very sort of hands-on with, with us, which was great. That's wonderful. So um, or do you think you'll be able to get a chance to go out and actually see the show uh, be performed? Um, yeah, so it's, uh, I think it opens at the beginning of October. So I'm hoping to get back to London to, to definitely see all the puppets come to life. That's awesome. Very cool. You know, one thing I want to talk about is uh, I actually get a lot of people messaging me about, about how, how to make a job in puppetry. Can you talk a little bit about that or, or really what that entails? Because I feel like when people say they want a job in puppetry, they think it's all fun and games. They're all just performing or something. And I'm sure that you have to hustle a lot and oh, yeah. go, go, go gig <laughs> by gig in order to make it full time. Can you talk yeah, a little bit yeah. about that? Um, yeah, so I think compared to everyone else you've had on so far, I feel like I'm super fresh into the industry. I've kind of only been involved in puppetry for about almost three years now and it's it is I feel like I'm still just just at the beginning of my career um, and it is a lot of emailing people all the time trying to make contact with people to see kind of where the next cool project is is going to be um, I find it a lot easier to get work as a maker just because I I've had more experience in that so far and now that I'm trying to sort of branch out and puppeteer as well I'm back at, at the start again trying to sort of make connections and and go from there but I'm hoping in like five years time people will start to to know my work and I'll have people contact me as well as me contacting them a lot of your work is, is you know very diverse a lot of the monitor style puppetry we see the stop animation I think that's what a lot of people don't always tend to realize is how diverse you have to be uh, in really any type of arts field but especially in puppetry yeah definitely so um, yeah as you're aware I, I do stop motion work there as well um, and then when there's not a job in stop motion if something comes up as puppeteer I'll flick to that sort of work so I'm just kind of always open to whatever interests me and, and where the next sort of thing will be and I, and I think the most important thing is that I'm really open to moving wherever that job is okay although I'm based in Bristol um, I've been in Bristol probably only about four months now but most of the time I've actually been in London for work so there's a lot of kind of going to London during the week, coming back to Bristol at the weekends to sort of make it work. But I knew that's what I was going into. And I think you need to be open to knowing that you'll have to move for a few months here, a few months there to different places to make it work. But if you're willing to do that, it's it's a really great industry to be part of for sure. I love that. Well, and I, 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 sorry, I just want to speak real quick to you. You mentioned that you don't have the experience and such of other people you've had on. And that yeah. was never our goal in, in starting puppeteers of having people with lots of experience. We're just looking for, for lots of passion. And when we saw your Instagram, we were like, oh my gosh, this looks like someone that we want to know more and that we think our friends and our listeners are going to want to hear more. So that's why you're here. It has nothing to awesome. do with, <laughs> with uh, the experience. So anyhow. I, I interrupted no, you. No, no, it's fine. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, um, no, I guess, uh, so the, you talk about like moving for projects. At what point do you see that a project is is um, lucrative enough to, to move for? Is mm -hmm. it a matter of how, uh, well, I guess it could be multiple things, whether it's how much income you get or how long of a project it is. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Um, so I guess, yeah, when, a, when an, something comes up, I have to sit down and weigh up the pros and cons of, of what it, what my kind of life balance will be, whether, it, whether it's worth kind of leaving sort of my family in Bristol to, to go and, and do that project. And sometimes it's based on what, what the pay is, because you obviously have to pay the bills and whether I can, you know, pay double rent wherever I am, things like that, or, or whether it's just a project I'm really passionate about, or if it's something I think that's going to help my career. Sometimes, yeah, you've got to sit down and, yeah, figure it out. <laughs> do you do many projects out of your own house for commissions? No, I don't at the moment just because I don't have a space for a workshop in, in our apartment. Um, I am fortunate, though, that I don't know if you guys have heard of Puppet Place, but they're, um, they're based in Bristol. You guys should um, check them out. So they're kind of a hub in the UK for um, puppetry over here. And I'm very fortunate that it's about a five minute walk from where I live and they've got a workspace there that I can um, potentially use when commissions come in. But that's only been recent. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to get some commissions and work out of there. That's Perfect. awesome. That's very cool. And yeah. super convenient of like just a five minute super walk. Super convenient. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, do you want to go back to the, to yeah. the beginning? Okay. So um, we, were, yeah. we were just wondering, so um, obviously you, you've mentioned that you you haven't been working that long professionally as a puppeteer, but what what were you like as a kid? What, what, were you the creative person? What what would, how would you describe yourself in, you know, the, the Katie Williams early years? Um, so I grew up in Australia. I don't know if you picked up my accent, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I was very much a creative person. So from like three years old, my mom put me into ballet classes and I was always involved in kind of dancing and being in school musicals, choir, um, that sort of thing. And then that led into being into involved in kind of drama and that sort of world. Um, and then when I finished school, I um, did, a, did a drama degree and then I ended up working um, as part of a physical theatre company in Brisbane. Um, and it was while I was working with them that I uh, was kind of told by by the artistic director there that, you know, have you thought about puppetry? And she kind of showed me Julie Taymor's sort of work and I saw that sort of stuff. And then I kind of fell into it, as most people do, um, when I was kind of asked to uh, be an assistant stage manager on a show, but also puppeteer in the show. And so I went, okay, cool, I'll give this a go. Um, and it was actually the workshop audition that I went to that was like my moment where I went, oh my gosh, this this is what I want to do. Um, the director was called Peter Wilson and he just ran this amazing workshop where he just showed us all kinds of different puppets. And I just had that moment where I saw the magic in puppetry. And, and from then I kind of had been going down this road to puppetry. <laughs> What do you remember seeing puppetry earlier on? Like when you were a, were a kid, was was there any influences b before you were you know at that before? stage? Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there de there were, but nothing that kind of I saw as puppetry. Like I think I obviously grew up with Sesame Street, but I didn't realize they were puppets when I was little. I I didn't know what they were, I guess. And then there was um, a TV show that was massive in Australia called um, The Ferals, um, which had I think four. Um, kind of hand and rod puppets in it. And I just remember loving the show and not really realizing it was puppets until I was till I was older. And then when I went to university, my puppetry teacher there had worked on that show. So there was this nice kind of childhood um, sort of reminiscing thing when, when this puppetry teacher came in with one of the puppets from the show and sort of talked about that. So yeah, there definitely was, but not anything that I was conscious about, I guess. Okay. Yeah, the ferals, that was in Australia, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, I just saw a video about that. I had not heard about it before. Yeah, just just like a week ago, there was this video. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, did you, did you see that? Yeah, so that was my teacher. Tina was my um, puppetry teacher when I was at, um, at NIDA, which is um, a drama school in Australia um, where I studied um, making. So she came in and taught a, a big puppetry subject there. So. so so, you actually saw that when it used to be on air? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I grew up watching that show, loved the show, mainly because the, the puppets just – abused each other and as kids like that was just so cool that they could get away with doing these things that I guess adults and kids can't couldn't really get away with but puppets could so oh yeah, yeah the, it was uh sure. the, the aesthetic of those characters they look so mm. grand it almost looks like something from uh like meet the feebles or something but uh but again but it was meant to be an actual kid show they were so yeah. kind of grotesque looking a little bit yeah at least compared to 
what you would think about for normal children's puppetry. Exactly. That was, yeah, that was I was fascinated by that story. Which I think is why is why it did so well. Is I think things like Sesame Street were. Yeah, I guess for the younger kids, but then when you, we got to kind of like 10, 11, we had the ferals and that was just as cool. And I think it's because it had that sort of edge to it that kind of a little kid, young, older kids, I guess, could relate to that more than sort of Sesame Street. Yeah, that's awesome. interesting. So then when you were when you were in school and um, you, you had that teacher who, who suggested, you know, have you ever thought about puppetry? What, what do you think about your work um, made them think that for you as, as a viable um viable realm to be working in? Uh, I think at the time, this is when I was working um, with a, a physical theatre company, um, which was separate to my, my university degree. Oh, um, sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, okay. no, that's fine. Um, I think it's because I um, always had an interest in just making things. I, I didn't, I just always liked to make stuff. And so when I was involved with that company, I would do a lot of kind of bits of design for them, a bit of making of props and stuff for shows. And so I guess she saw this sort of side of me where I really love to kind of craft stuff as well. And I had a big interest in sort of visual theater as well. And so it was a way, I guess, to combine but that as well as kind of my love for kind of physical theater. Combine all, tick all the boxes, I guess, of my interests. <laughs> did they for actually sure. suggest puppetry to you or did they suggest theater? Uh, they suggested, I was told to go and look at the work of Julie Taymor. So yeah, yeah, so that led me down that path interesting awesome yeah. um was there anything else you thought you'd be doing when when you were young looking at yourself now um i always thought that i would be involved in in the theater world in some way i i guess like a lot of people i started out wanting to be an actor um and then i had to go at directing and i really liked that as well but then i was always in my spare time making things so now i look back on it i can see it makes perfect sense the direction that i've gone in although when i was younger i I couldn't piece those those things together. But yeah, so still definitely in some kind of creative theater, film, TV sort of world, but not necessarily puppetry. So so then when you looked up uh, Julie Taymor and whether you picked up a book from the library or just Googled it or, or whatever, yeah, yeah. What, what were your first thoughts when you sort of saw that work? I imagine by that point she had done The Lion King, maybe The Magic yeah. Flute, stuff like that. Yeah, so yeah. so what, what were your immediate thoughts about that I just thought it was amazing and I I think for me I thought that oh this this is for me I feel like I felt this is somewhere that I could fit in I always wanted to sort of perform and that sort of thing but I never felt like I was good enough at acting or had the confidence to do that sort of thing and um, I think I found a niche that kind of just worked for me and as an audience member as well I just felt like it it was just amazing work Right. Well, and if you were already in the world of dance, she so well incorporates the, yeah. the dance and the physical in, into that work. So I could see that really driving for you. Yeah. And also, I, I would say that I think there's a lot um, in the fact that she was a female as well. Me seeing another female in the, in the role that she was doing was really great for me, because I think a lot of time in puppetry world, it's quite male dominated. So it was really nice to see a female doing something and going, oh, hey, I could do that as well. well yeah definitely so so then how did you how did you react what were your first steps in time in sort of pursuing puppetry for for yourself uh so i did did this show where i was um puppeteering and an asming which was like a, a large scale um children's show at, at a festival in back in brisbane and then i really wanted to um learn the skills of being able to make puppets um so that i could make my own puppets and then and then perform them so then i ended up going to study um, a Bachelor of Properties um, at NIDA, which is the natural, National Institute of Dramatic Art in um, Sydney. So I moved to Sydney and basically spent three years learning how to make all kinds of things. Um, but from day one, I had just told my teachers, you know, I just want to make puppets. But they were like, you've got to learn how to make furniture. I'm like, but can I make puppets? Like, you've got to learn how to do this. I'm like, but can it be a puppet? And so I, I spent three years trying to make everything be a puppet. and. To the most extent, I, I got my way, but I still had to make furniture, which 
<laughs> Which you could still do in a pinch if you needed to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, a lot of those skills apply to puppetry Definitely. in all different forms of puppetry. A lot of right. people don't realize the more uh, diverse you can be in your skill set, whether it's sewing, like if you yeah. learn tailoring and actual furniture making, if you exactly. just do puppetry, it's going to give you a big uh, step above other people getting into it. Yeah, definitely. So we learned the course was amazing and like an incredible course. We did everything from wood basics of woodwork to I learned how to weld. Um, we did kind of um, uh, pattern making, which like obviously is perfect for puppetry. Although at the time we were doing pattern making for covering a couch, but you know it translates to puppetry, of course. Um, and we did jewelry making, and then we did small scale model making, which is how I went down the stop motion way. I think. Um, yeah, everything, all kinds of skills, molding and casting, which is obviously really important. But yeah, everything, which was great. I love it. So did you leave Australia right after that? I did. So I was really fortunate that um, I was managed to get a scholarship from my university to go anywhere in the world to do an internship, um, which is how I ended up at Ardman. Um, so I flew straight over after I finished um, and did two weeks um, as an intern on Early Man. Um, I did kind of a week working in their puppet workshop and a week um, in the art department and set dressing. So everything kind of just went from, from that internship. I definitely grown up with Wallace and Gromit. Um, it wasn't something that, it's not, a, it, it wasn't as celebrated in Australia as it, obviously it is in the UK. Now I know, now I'm especially living in Bristol, like it's the home of Ardman, so. Every, everyone knows about Wallace and Gromit where I am now, but I definitely grew up. I knew what it was. I knew Sean the Sheep and things like that, definitely. So so what what were some of the things that you learned in that short time while while you were there? I, I imagine you were probably just a sponge and, and picking everything up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I got, I got to do a bit of everything, which was great. So I, I spent a week in, in puppets and it was a lot of um, molding, casting, replacement face parts and things like that for the puppets. But then I also got to see all the different teams with each of their puppets that they were working on, making their costumes, looking at the armatures. I got to go have a look at the sets. I got to do a bit of set dressing, um, small scale, like gardening on one of the sets, which I really enjoyed. Um, yeah, just a little bit of everything. This, yeah, it was, it was really good. That's great. Um, and so when you were there working um, on Early Man, what at what point of the process were they in in terms of the production? Were they actively animating things or were, were you there really just for, for pre-production purposes or what 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 stage of the movie were they in? Um, it was quite early, but they had, I believe, just started filming. So they were still sort of um, finalizing things with some of the characters. So it was nice to see them sort of quite, quite an, an early stage and then later on see them in the film and how they changed. But uh, they had started filming. There were animators in doing sort of testing and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. How, how long did that whole movie take to make? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Probably four Ooh. years or more, right? Adding, I would be very much guessing because I was only there for two weeks. I'd say normally it would be... I know I Love Dogs was over two years. So I'd have guessed something, something similar to that. Which they've come a long way. Things like um, Nightmare Before Christmas was like seven years or something like that when they did Right, it. right, right. So <laughs> things, things are getting better. <laughs> things are getting faster. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I imagine like at this point, because I know a lot of the, the pieces end up now getting like 3D printed and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure a lot of the technology has caught up that the mass production mm -hmm. element that needs to happen, or maybe not. Um, I, I just know, like, on Kubo and stuff, they yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. 3D printing, yeah. I think Leica's um, definitely going, gone down that direction. I find from my experience when I've been at, at Arben and also on Isle of Dogs, everything that we did, in with the puppets at least, was all done by hand. There was not much. So for Isle of Dogs, all the faces, everything was sculpted by hand. There was no 3D printing for that, which was some, that's what, something that's really special about it, but I guess would also slow things up. <laughs> yeah no i was i was just watching um the early man uh yesterday and in, in prepping for this and um it, it reminded me of like in the wallace and Gromit and stuff like just to be able to see like on certain shots like the thumbprints and such yeah, yeah, of, like, yeah. you really get that hand handmade quality to it yeah so it's that's, really nice. that's awesome so adam you want to start talking a little well no you, for, uh, on this uh so maybe we can kind of talk more about isle of dogs oh first. sure 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 yeah since it kind of ties right into it yeah <laughs> so what was your contribution to the isle of dogs um, so for Isle of Dogs, I was in the puppet department, 
but I was very specifically in a tiny uh, team making all the props that the puppets have. So uh, any of the glasses that they wore, wore um, the dog collars, uh, anything that they kind of picked up and, and held, we I may have made. So very niche. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what kind of considerations do, do you guys have to think about that for that? Because I know like when when Adam has to make props for our, our puppet work, obviously there's a, a component of weight because things have to be light enough for a, a rod character to pick up. But sometimes you need to put rods in, in your things or, or they have to be hollow on one side. So what kind of considerations did you have to make? I'm sure the script called for a lot of things, but as, as you're building those props for the stop motion character. Yeah. So there's a, there's, I think there's, that's where the difference is, I guess, between live puppetry and animation is that there are, when you're making sort of props is um, everything has to be kind of be able to be moved, but also stay fixed when you want it to. So a lot of things, so for instance, if you had a dog collar that had a lead, the lead itself would need to have some kind of armature wire in it so that it could be bent, but also then stay where the animator wants it to and then bend again. So little things like that, you always had to sort of consider and then test um, with an animator to make sure that it worked in the way it needed to. Um, so for instance, I worked on um, for quite a long while to get it right on Atari has a slingshot that he uses. Um, and so the actual kind of rubber bit that he pulls um, had, I think, I can't remember what, I think it was an armature wire that I ended up using and then had to dip it in all kinds of different sort of tinted silicon so that it was soft enough but could also still stay in place. So there was a lot of trial and error to get that right so that it was perfect for the animator. But then also be aware that um, things like armature wire is gonna snap, so there's lots of spares for stuff, um, lots of duplicates, and then the duplicates have to be perfectly matched to the original one, obviously, so there's no kind of inconsistencies. And yeah, there's a lot of different things that when I first started out in, in this world, I didn't know. I, I knew the skills of making things, but I didn't know all the kind of little details and bits and pieces that you needed to know for when a, a prop needs to be animated or a puppet needs to be animated so that it, it works. Right. So exactly and, what scale are we talking? Like how tall is one of those dogs? Um, I, so there, there were a few different scales that they were made in. So the, the human characters, I think they had about four scales in the end. The two main ones was a, a large and a medium. And then I think there was... A small and then for a couple of them there was an extra large size so a large human puppet would be about I would say about 20 to 30 centimeters at a guess standing and then yeah the next scale down would be I, I don't know I'm guessing yeah <laughs> so um in, in what cases would they switch it for close-ups was it a the bigger puppet and yeah yeah wide shots full body shot to, to smaller puppets it was smaller puppets yeah so what they could if if it was like a long shot they could get away with a lot more and they could have a small puppet it meant that they could make smaller sets which cut down obviously the cost of things so they would switch in a smaller puppet but then if they needed a close-up they would obviously need a bigger puppet to get all the detail really nice on that puppet and then of course when when um we're then going between scales so if i've got a pair of glasses that i've got to make for a large puppet i then got to replicate that to a medium size and then a small size and then you've got to think of the scaling of the materials you're using to make sure that works accurately on camera so that when everything's blown up together it all looks the same scale if you understand exactly yeah a lot of people so, don't realize let's say let's say one of the characters had a like a checker shirt on you exactly. can't use the same fabric for both yeah. of them because the scale of, of the checkers would be different as well yeah yeah so there's a lot of different testing of different materials to make sure that that all sort, sort of works yeah right yeah which makes it so you can't really use found objects as much either because yeah. again they won't scale either. everything it's made <laughs> i can't even think of anything that we used when we were making the props that was a bought a bought in sort of found thing everything i'm from memory we made from scratch but there, there was a lot of kind of we would um so for instance for the glasses we would draw them up um on a program called rhino um and then we'd actually send outsource them um to be metal etched so they were etched on brass and they would come back to us in brass and then we take the pieces out and do what we needed to to them from that so there was a little bit of that sort of thing happening but what um, about even like uh scaling the fur like for the dogs because like yeah at different scales even that would look pretty different 
I fur is not my area, so I'm probably not the person to ask. I don't want to say all the wrong things, but I know there was a different, a completely different process that they used for the large scale dogs as opposed to the smaller dogs. I think one of them they were hand punching every single hair in, and then I think another scale it was kind of a process of um, putting the fur onto some kind of uh, a, like a lycery sort of stocking sort of thing, and then like pattern making it onto onto the puppet. But I could be wrong in saying all of that. Someone's going to message me and say, that's not what we did. <laughs> Got it. Now, I, I understand on some some animated projects, they'll actually build duplicates of the set so that you could um, speed up production. Was there any of that that you're aware of on Isle of Dogs that in, in those cases you had to make double the props because there were multiple sets happening at once? I know. So for, for us in the puppets department, our whole uh, workshop was actually completely separate to where they were shooting. We were about 10 minutes down the road from where they were shooting the film. So what was going on on set, we were kind of a bit oblivious to. So I can't say in that sense. All I know is that we did make multiples of all of the puppets because they were being used at multiple times, whether that was on mul the same, like multiple sets that were the same or whether that was on different sets, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, for I don't know how many Ataris there were in the end, but there were probably ten large, ten medium. Do you know what I mean? There were there were lots and lots, and they all those props had to be absolutely identical um, to the first one that went on set. Holy cow! Now you you may not be able to speak to this, but I know again when when Adam makes props or costumes or or what have you for his his puppets, um, when there needs to be like a an R and D component of making sure it, it works, he's able to just put the puppet on, you know, move around and sh you know sh give it a good shake and oh that works or oh no I need to modify that. When you guys yeah. are working on these stop motion puppets, is there a component of you guys having to animate them to make sure that something like the slingshot works Watch. or does that go yeah. off to an animator and then come back to you guys like what, what's that process like um so there was two different processes so there was obviously um the animated side to make sure things work but then there was also I had to get the tick of approval from Wes obviously aesthetically and he wasn't on set so we would have to take photographs of everything and then they would get sent to Wes himself and then we would get feedback from that and alter it aesthetically once that had kind of gone through that process then it would go on set to an animator to do a whole bunch of testing and then come back to us again with anything that needed to kind of be tweaked or or changed so it was a long process i remember there was one of the puppets um peppermint who i spent i think about six weeks making the props that she she has on her she's got kind of like um tubes coming out of her because she's been tested on and um, plasters on her face and things like that and I think it was six weeks that I spent going back and forth to kind of get that right so Holy cow. and just tiny changes as well but that's how you get the the beautiful final products that you get I guess were you able to be on set at all for any of the filming no I went and had a look at the set a couple of times but I wasn't on set no each week we did get to see the rushes for the week before and it was something like between 40 seconds and, and a minute of footage for an entire week of of I can't remember how many animators there were, but you know a lot of animators all working, ten hour days, and you get a minute of footage a week. So yeah, it's very different than other forms of puppetry. People <laughs> might want to visit Sesame Street for a day, be on the set of the Muppets, be on the set of Dog Isle. I saw, yeah. I saw three seconds of production today. It might not even be used. Yeah. <laughs> it was such a it was such a beautiful movie though. Mm. It was it was really nice to, to see the final product at the end, definitely, especially because that's like my first professional sort of stop motion that I'd worked on. It was it was quite special to see. How how long were you working uh, with the studio on that? Um, so I was on it for just over a year. So I came on it. I think they'd been working on it for about about four or five months when I started, and then I was on it till when it wrapped up, or when our department sort of finished up. Right. And um, did, did that happen directly because of your association with Ardman or, or what, what were the steps to get uh, to get working with them? Uh, so I found out about Isle of Dogs while I was at Ardman um, and I, I Fantastic Mr. Fox was just hands down my favorite stop motion. And so I just decided that somehow I was going to get a job on this film because I'd moved from Australia to be in this country to, to work in this industry. And I was just so determined that I wanted to work on it so I just got some contacts while I was at Ardman I um, then just moved 
to London where the film was being shot and got a house in the area where it was being shot without any contact from anyone on the film and just hoped that at some point someone would, it would work out for me, which fortunately it did, but it, it could have not. Um, and it was a bit of just kind of emailing and emailing. And I think I just had good timing um, when they needed someone. Um, and I came in, had an interview, came in and I was on trial for a little while. And then I was just in casually just covering people when they were on holidays for a little bit. And then eventually I was um, on it full time, which is... But, th but that just goes to show the, the level of dedication that you would have had. I mean, to literally move yeah. move a few minutes from the studio. I mean, that's that's incredible. And I'm so, so glad that that ended up working out. Me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. I th yeah, I think I'd moved from Australia. So moving from Bristol to London was like, ugh. I'm just going to do it. You get one chance sometimes to do things. So being a, you know, essentially running your own business as a, as a puppet artist, how far ahead do you try to book stuff to where, to where you would move? Um, so because I was new to the country, I hadn't sort of found a, a, a base. Now I kind of have my home in, in Bristol and I'm set up here. So back then it was, it was easy. I could kind of just go wherever work was. And I was fortunate that I could just find someone that could kind of take over my room where I was staying at the time and I would just kind of up and go. So I was flexible. Now it's a bit trickier because I'm, I'm, I live in Bristol now and that's kind of where I'm based, but I'm still just open to making it work so that I can. Well, a lot of people don't realize too, is even a matter of booking the work is, is so difficult in that, like, you don't want to book yourself too far ahead to where yeah. you might have to turn down other things. But yeah. then again, how, how close is too close to the end of the project where you're like, okay, how am I going to pay for the next yeah, yeah, month yeah. of rent or something? It does get, in the workshop, you get this feeling when things are wrapping up that everyone starts to get, the panic sets in of what am I going to do next? Um, and I think when a project finishes, you kind of have the first two weeks off and you're like, this is nice. And then after that, you go, oh gosh, when's the next project? I got to start calling and emailing people. Um, but something always comes up is what I found. You know, I always, I'm also really aware of having to budget really well with my money so that I never end up in a position where I can't pay can't pay for things that I need to pay for. I think that's really important if you're a freelancer that you can do that. Otherwise you can get yourself in all kinds of. And I imagine a big thing with it. this industry too, is like, of course your quality of work and how, uh, how much people enjoy working with you, that those other people get onto the next project and then they keep you in mind. They need somebody yeah, else to doing yeah. something. Yeah. So with Isle of Dogs, um, the, the head of the puppet department there, he has his own company that I've gone back to London and, and worked a bit for on some TV commercials and things like that. So that's definitely happened. And then I've also been back to Ardman again after I did my internship working on some commercials there as well. So there definitely is this, once you've kind of made some contacts, hopefully when they need someone else, they'll remember you and, and get you back in. So um, obviously you, you've spent time working in, in these professional shops on, on other people's work, but you've also been able to spend time building up your own personal portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, does that happen when, does that happen at the same time that you're working at these other places? Or is, is that when, when things are sort of slow, you, you're able to carve out time for your own work? What's, what's that balance for you? Yeah. So I normally have something going on in my head always of like what I want to do when I have, you know, the time off. Um, and so, yeah, it's when I've got a chunk, two weeks off here or there that I'll um, start working on my own sort of projects. So next week I'm going to start um, designing a hand and rod puppet because I have never made one before. And I think it's about time that I make one. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm going to going to do. And then what happens is I normally start working on something and then a job will come up and I put it to the side and I'll come back to it when I've got some more time off. So. I get there eventually and finish things, but <laughs> yeah. So um, again, just looking through through your your website a little bit, um, it seems like you've got some really cool projects like Howard and and Freak Show. Do, can you talk about um, what those projects are and and what you've been able to do with them? Um, yeah. So um, the project with Howard was actually um, something that I created when I was. Um, at the beginning of this year, I was in Edinburgh and I went and decided that I wanted to train professionally as a puppeteer because um, I, I dabbled in it a bit in Australia um, and I knew that I wanted to learn more. And so I dedicated sort of three months at the beginning of this year to sort of learn the craft. Um, and it was while I was there that I made that puppet and then I created um, a short sort of um, 
five minute sketch with the puppet, which is um, a two in one sketch. So I'm like the actor in it and then the puppeteer is a puppet and we interact with each other. So and now uh, we'll, we'll throw a picture up online for, for people who are watching the video, but for people yeah. uh, in their cars listening for the podcast version, could you describe what the Howard puppet uh, looks like? He's a really simple um, tabletop puppet, um, really, I don't know, a really basic sort of design, but I think he works quite well in his simplicity. Um, it's quite innocent looking, but that means he can be quite naughty in what he does. So, <laughs> so, so you're there as as the human actor, like yeah. really working working against him. Um, yeah. So, is that something that you consciously set out to do? That you really wanted to. Um, be be on stages yourself as well as puppeteering because i know we know some puppeteers who never want to be seen they just want to be mm -hmm. like sewn into the couch under the table yeah. <laughs> type thing um was, was that something that you set out wanting to do or was that something that the story and, and the puppet just called for i think i was presented with the opportunity to be able to do this piece and at first i i thought it was the possibly one of the most terrifying things i could do and so decided to say yes i'll commit to doing it um and then actually really thoroughly enjoyed doing it. It wasn't something that I'd done before. The puppeteering I'd done before had been straight. I was the puppeteer and I was not an actor um, at the same time, but I really enjoyed the challenge of flicking between two this. I learned so much from doing that piece. It's such a skill in being able to go from being the actor to then actually the focus is on your puppet to then the focus is on you. And it's really, it was really scary, but I'm really glad that I did it as well. Yeah, for sure. That's good. That's great. And then um, going back a little bit, the the Freak Show project? Yeah, so that was um, a project that I did while I was at um, NIDA. Um, and they basically, the five uh, students on our course, um, the props course, we each designed a puppet and a mask. Um, and then we worked with the directing master's students to create a 40 minute show um, using the puppetry and using the mask within the show. So I created um, a, a bird mask, which is like a full head um, mask. And then my puppet was um, like a Shelob-esque spider puppet for that. And everyone did something completely different and the directors came in and we wrote a script and we created this like 40 minute show, which was, which was pretty cool. Wow. Awesome. And we built the set and designed the set as well, which was, was great. And I had to have all kinds of sort of tricks and me mechanisms and stuff like that, which was great. Yeah, because, uh, again, pe people don't always think about, like, when, when you're writing a show for puppets or even any kind of theater show, when there are gags and stuff that need to happen on your set, those have to all be, be planned out before you yeah, yeah. go into it. So that's really cool that you guys were able to dedicate that time to, to constructing that whole world. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. It was really amazing. So we saw you were involved in the Ed Sheeran's music video, Happier. Oh, okay. So <laughs> I wasn't involved in the music video itself, but there are these small kind of, um, I guess they, uh, they call them idents, where he kind of comes in and uh, the, he, the puppet is used to kind of advertise different bits and pieces. So the puppet from the music video was brought back to do some kind of little advertising bits for on his Facebook and things like that. And so um, I was fortunate enough to be able to come in and be an assistant puppeteer for that shoot, which was really great. I really enjoyed it. That's really oh, that's cool. Awesome. So, so what did you do in the puppetry for, for those uh, adverts? So um, there was a main uh, puppeteer, which was a good friend of mine, um, and I came in to be the other puppeteer, so uh, doing the upgrading the arms mostly. Okay, awesome. That's, that's great. Yeah. So really, really simple stuff, but I guess that's where you where you start out, isn't it? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah for but sure. I, I know. Well, you said you weren't involved in the main um, no. uh, YouTube uh, video. That's uh, the music video, but on yeah. YouTube that has over a, about a hundred and eighty million views. I think. So yeah. I mean, so definitely you have some eyes on people, I and mean, I'm assuming a lot of those people already follow him on his Facebook and were able to see those kind of ads and whatnot. So it's cool to hear. Yeah. Uh, it was great to work with, with that puppet as well. It was really amazing to kind of just see it and, and, and it's an amazing puppet to work with. So that was really good in itself. That's great. And so um, you, you've mentioned now um, you'll be building a, a hand rod puppet that Ed Sheeran, you were, were perfor performing that. Um, when did you start 
teaching yourself those skills to, to be able to do uh, that kind of puppetry. Uh, so as part, oh, as part of the, um, the training that I did at the start of the year, we did uh, a section on kind of puppetry for screen. And so lip sync was taught um, as part of that. And it was hands down just my favorite, favorite part of, of what we did. And yeah, since then, I just want to do more and learn more about that. So I want to build a puppet for myself so that I can then, a friend of mine and I are going to shoot some um, scenes, mainly just some sort of screen tests so we can practice the lip sync techniques and, and build our skills in that sort of way. For sure. Well, and that's how everybody gets started and, and yeah. it's just, you know, putting it up in lip syncing and, you know, right hand. Just, yeah, it's because mm -hmm. it's it's a skill that takes a long time to have to be able to do. So, yeah, um, that's cool. So is that um, this curious school of, of puppetry? Is that yeah. what, um, is that part of this, this sort of training program that you're you're going to be continuing? And, and or could you talk about that a little bit? Um, so curious school of puppetry is um, a three month uh, intensive course that's run in the UK and it, it moves around cities each year. It's been running for three years now. Um, the first two years it was in London and then this year it was up in Edinburgh. Uh, I'm not sure where it's going to be next year, but um, it's six days a week, um, full time, and every day you're just learning the techniques of different kinds of puppetry. We did marionettes, we did shadow, we did tabletop, we did some lip sync stuff and, and a bit of sort of devising our own work using puppets. Um, and then each week um, on a Thursday evening, uh, someone from the industry would come in and speak about how they got into the industry, I guess similar to what we're doing now, but they'd do a sort of a presentation and say how they sort of started out. Um, yeah, it was, I think it's um, a really great way for anyone that's, that's really interested in sort of pursuing this professionally to sort of get the really strong sort of skills of a puppeteer. Um, and I don't, I don't know of anything else that's similar to that over here in the UK. Um, I know there are different degrees and stuff, but not something that's sort of a s intensive sort of three months. Um, and the teachers that come in are, are all from the industry. So they'll come in from their sort of specialty. So we had a, a teacher that was, they specialized in marionettes and they would come in and, and teach that for a week, two weeks. And then someone would come in and teach tabletop for a week or two weeks with us and they're all sort of people that are, are working puppeteers in the industry. So this is something that you great. you did as a, as a participant? Yeah, so I, I was a, one of the, I think there were 16 students that they take each year. So I was one of the students for the for the three months. That's great. That sounds similar to um, in, in America, we have this wonderful puppetry conference uh, at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center, um, which is, it's only uh, two weeks uh, an intensive uh, or, yeah. or one if you you just do the main conference. But um, it's a similar type thing where you're you're sort of inundated with different professionals who are just really mm -hmm. you know, firing off skills and you work on different, different pieces and stuff. So that's wonderful that there's something over there that um, has some history and, and is operating on a regular yeah. schedule too. I think it was very much needed as well in, in the industry. I think, I don't know if it's the same over there, but over here, puppetry has just become so popular, especially in sort of the theatre world. Um, it's been incorporated in, in ways that it kind of hasn't done before, I guess, inspired, it came from War Horse over here. And now it seems that puppetry is kind of, is filtering in, in, in a lot more ways than it was before. And I think having a, a proper training program um, is so important because there are so many, um, people that are going and, tr and attempting puppetry, but not with the skills to kind of, I guess, um, bring the quality of, of what you need for a good sort of puppetry performance. And I think it's so important to have somewhere that is training people so that the audiences are seeing puppetry in the way that it should be seen, in the way that I guess we've all seen good puppetry and that's why we love it, but we've all seen not so good puppetry. And so a course like this is kind of, yeah, it can be equally as inspiring to see <laughs> that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So well, and even for you to be able to to network with other people, um, yeah, not only yeah. not only the instructors, but just the the cohort that that you're with learning. I mean, some of our best friends who we end up collaborating with are are people who we meet at the the puppetry festivals or the conferences and such. Yeah. I'm sure you made some really great contacts there. Yeah, definitely. So the my um, friend that I'm going to be making the hand and roll puppet with and shooting some stuff was I met during that course. So definitely everyone seems to kind of 
click together and, and make their work and but then also go off and do their own sort of freelance stuff as well and then come back together for another project and there's definitely also a, a sort of a family within the sort of um, people that have done the course from all of the years and there's a, a lot of kind of uh, times throughout the year where we'll try to have a meetup so everyone can kind of get together and um, share ideas of what they've been working on or I don't know what glue they use to glue this foam together you know there's there's a there's a network there which um, is is really great especially when you're new to new to the industry and also new to the country as well so so as you're continuing to to work and and learn more about these things what are you hoping sort of your next steps are going to be in terms of um either continuing to perform and build or w what's what are some of your long-term aspirations for for what you're working on uh, so i think i have kind of spent the last sort of three years since moving here sort of building my skills um, and my network as a, as a maker and now I, I feel like I'm at a point where I want to try and do the same but as a puppeteer so I really at the moment want to focus on trying to do some more get more experience puppeteering I'm particularly interested in in the screen sort of side of it um, film tv that sort of world so I'm really looking to um, try to get some as more assistant puppeteering jobs is where I'd ideally like to go. Um, and then eventually in the future, I guess the dream job or the goal would be to be kind of a um, puppetry coordinator for um, a, a film that has puppetry in it. So you're kind of working with the puppeteers, but also overseeing the making. So I can kind of flick and use all of those skills. Fingers crossed that all works out. <laughs> Well, you just have to you have to move across the street of wherever the filming is happening, and then just hope that they exactly. <laughs> it's worked Definitely. out pretty well for you so far, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a good track record for that. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> um, do the, do they have a, a really big slam scene at all, particularly, or chances for sort of a potpourri of shows of like just different short acts? Um, where well, like, where a, you guys like are? a cabaret sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they they call them puppet slams over over here. Uh, I haven't heard that before. Yeah. Um, I have been to a couple of sort of puppet cabarets. They're normally, from my experience, attached to a puppetry festival um, over here. So there'll be a, all kinds of professional acts will have their, their main sort of stage shows and then they'll have an evening where it'll be sort of shorter sort of sketches and, and stuff like that. But I haven't heard of a, a puppetry slam sort of thing. But that doesn't mean it doesn't to come exist. to America. And <laughs> yeah, definitely. How does it work? What is it? So it's um it's just a really great way for um different styles of puppetry, different performers, um and even like different themes to to happen um in one evening. It's sometimes like just a, a basement of a theater or like it's there's it's typically very low production value, which there's a charm to that. Um, yeah. but yeah, it just allows like acts for anywhere from like two to five minutes. Sometimes they're a little bit longer. But to just come through and for an audience to really see a, a, a great cross section of of different different styles. We have a national puppetry slam every year that either happens at um, at Dragon Con or the Puppeteers of America uh, Festival, the National uh, Puppeteers uh, Puppeteers of America Festival, um, yeah. and and then there's all sorts of small slams that happen. Sometimes they're themed. Uh, we had Jean Marie Kevens on a couple of weeks ago, and she talked about a puppet playlist. Uh, yeah. where all of the acts are either like they'll have a Billy Joel night or they'll have a classic rock evening. So it's all uh, acts a uh, acted out to to those songs. Um, but yeah, a oh, lot of times awesome. they, they do a lot in Boston, too, don't they? Uh, yeah. Uh, usually if there's a puppet theater or or a, a big puppet community, they have them pretty regularly. So the Puppet Show Place Theater yeah. in, in Boston or there's all sorts of stuff happening out in L.A. I need to... Um get that started over here that sounds really cool that's not something that i have seen over here we we would more have something like a like a, a scratch tent which is where um i guess indie sort of puppetry companies would put forth like a 15 minute performance and then the audience would kind of often offer sort of written feedback as kind of i guess a they do it just to help uh give feedback on on a show so then they can develop it into kind of a, a full length performance so more that sort of thing than uh, than than what you guys have. But that sounds really cool. Have you yeah. ever been to America? No, I haven't. I actually, when I was gonna come over here, um, it was either gonna be coming to the UK or going to the US because they were the sort of the two places that I 
I knew I would um, be able to find proper tree, I guess. Um, and obviously I, I'd, I'd looked into places like Lycra and I'd been in conversations with them at one point about maybe doing an internship there. And it just ended up that it worked out for me to come to Ardman. And also my parents are from here, so I had a passport. So that mm. just that yeah, works out. made it, yeah. but it works out basically. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> That's how it sort of ended up. But I'm definitely open to coming to the US one day. I'd, I'd love to see what you guys are up to over there. There's obviously so much going on in the pop tree world. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty good time <laughs> for this kind of stuff. So, um, so you know, if, if any of us were lucky enough to choose the exact path we get to go down, mm-hmm. uh, and or if you could only choose one of those styles of puppetry, what do you think you would lean more toward? Toward the um, stop animation, or for toward the monitor puppetry, or something else? Um, I think, I think it will change as my career progresses, but I can only say where I'm at at the moment. Um, I'm really interested in uh, puppetry for screen, but um, more in kind of uh, how they use it for CG. Um, so um, I'm not even sure what that's actually technically called, but I guess more of like a tabletop kind of style uh, puppetry. So not a hand and not a hand and then lip sync sort of style. Um, and it's used and then the CG team come later and um, do their CG, having used the puppetry in the background um, as their guide. So that's the kind of area I'm really interested in. I think in the UK it's um, becoming quite popular again. A lot of sort of films over here are using that and then, yeah, using CG on the top. Yeah, similar to like what they're doing with the Star Wars uh, characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that kind of, and I think... um, the Fantastic Beasts, I think they use that sort of style a little bit in that as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, a really wonderful trend that we're starting to see. You know, for years and years and years, there was the argument of, oh, it's got to be puppets, sir. It's got to be CG. And yeah. I think that the technology. Can work together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, the you know, you could get the, the chocolate in the peanut butter type type scenario. Exactly, of, exactly. of, yeah, really marrying both technologies because they're both at the top of their game now. Um, and you, I, the, the finished product really does... Um, I think land better on on screen so yeah to be able to be a part of that would be wonderful and also for the for the actors themselves having something there that they can interact with as opposed to a ball on a stick that's (laughs) right sitting still if you know I mean there's there's it's got to be better for for an actor's perspective to have something they can play against as well opposite for sure so that's kind of the direction I'd like to go in I think at the moment it could change but then also if, if a really great stop motion project came up, I'd also be tempted by that as well. So I just at the moment go from, yeah, whatever the next interesting thing that comes up, I'll go in that direction. That's wonderful. So is there anything you want to say to anyone who says that they want to be a full-time professional puppeteer? Any advice for them? Oh, I feel like I'm too new in this to, to give advice. Um, well, you know, that's I think that's when it's easier for someone to relate to because a lot of times you see other people that have been doing it for years and yeah. years, and actually a lot of those people it was a different time back then getting right. into it. Definitely. You know, it was a matter you know the way the world is so connected now. It was it was um, probably if they found somebody with those kind of skills, they probably wanted to hold on to them a little harder because mm-hmm. now it's uh, I, I think maybe a little easier to at least for people to find out about those opportunities, which makes that that stack of interviews or auditions much bigger than it used to be. Yeah, I, th- I remember, I can't remember who it was, who said that when they first started out um, working as a puppeteer in sort of the film industry, they started because they saw an ad in the newspaper looking for an apprentice puppeteer and they were like, oh, what's that? I'll give it a go. And here they are working on like Star Wars now. It just doesn't happen like that anymore. But no, it doesn't. Yeah. Oh yeah, even so, uh, I, was, I remember hearing a story about someone like going up to the Henson workshop years ago and knocking on the door, and then oh sure, let me show you around things like that. It's right. like it's not like that anymore. <laughs> no, at all. No. Yeah. I well, think even, I... yeah, even from a puppetry standpoint, I think we talked about it. Was it with Peter about how you know back then they took people in and kind of trained them more? Because now we're at a point you got to walk yeah. in with those skills. Exactly. Yeah. Definitely. So I don't know if I can offer advice other than um it's just about being persistent i think and being okay with uh not having work all the time and having that backup job that you go back to and being okay with that 
And then also knowing that you're probably going to have to move for a job, being okay with that. And I guess you have to really, really want to do it to, to, to stay in it in the long haul because it, it's quite a big sacrifice, all those different sort of things. But then the payoff is, makes it worth it, I think. Um, so the name of the, the podcast is, is Puppeteers. And yeah. uh, we like to ask people about sort of a crazy story that may have happened to them. Uh, we kind of gather around the campfire and, and hear something crazy that, that happened to you that was probably pretty dreadful at the time. But now looking back on it, we get to sort of laugh about it. So is, that our, is there a story? Yeah, that yeah. About? there yeah, is a story. Yeah, we... I might get in trouble for this, but... Um... <laughs> Don't worry, <laughs> nobody's when... watching. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Um, when I was on Isle of Dogs, there was one day when um, we lost a puppet in the workshop. We just oh. lost a puppet. And they're worth like 20 to 30,000 pounds each. And we just, we couldn't find it anywhere. It was, it was a crazy day and it needed to be on set and we just lost it. We found it eventually, so it was fine. But at the time it was like, <laughs> how do you lose a 30,000 yeah. pound puppet? So yeah. it was just like, it was like a small, it was a small kind of cat. Um, puppet so it was quite small and it was in like a, a ziploc bag like tidy but it uh -huh. had just like slipped underneath something so everyone in the workshop was yeah. just freaking out because we'd lost this <laughs> puppet that needed to be on set it's like how yeah. do you explain that we lost it <laughs> yeah that's so, not a conversation you want to have with with wes anderson the, exactly oh, yeah. sorry we lost your puppet <laughs> yeah. oh, geez. and at that point i'm sure it's less about the money too it just meant of holding up production they'd probably exactly. pay a hundred thousand dollars to have one immediately exactly. rather than the thirty thousand yeah oh my gosh and the weeks that it takes yeah exactly to get them right 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 where they need to be so, oh my god that was a stressful few hours until we found it and then it was like whew. <laughs> oh, good. Back to work. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. So if people want to follow your work or get in contact with you, what's the best way to uh, for them to get in contact with you? Um, I would say I post mostly on Instagram. So you can follow my Instagram, which is just Katie Williams Puppetry. Um, and I post there quite regularly. If I'm working on something I'm allowed to post um, publicly, then I'll normally kind of upload my process of making or what I'm auditioning for or something I'm puppeteering on. So I really love sharing where I'm my, my journey, I guess, in my career and for everyone to see. Perfect. And um and hopefully we'll be able to see you as you work on the the hand rod puppet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. I'm actually I'm gonna do um a poll, I think, because I don't I can't decide what I want to make. So I'm gonna get people to kind of vote so they can they can decide for me what they want to see me make. So, well, not to cross promote, but Adam Krutinger here is about to have a, a puppet building oh, video nice. tutorial on how to make a, a pretty nice monster puppet. So, you know, I've actually <laughs> I've actually seen your videos. My um my uh lip sync teacher um when I was like I want to make a hand rub puppet sent me all your videos. So I've seen all your videos, <laughs> and I'm gonna be using all of your videos to uh, teach myself how to make this, which I love about the puppetry community. I feel like most people are quite open to sort of share the glue that they use to glue the foam together or what mm -hmm. stitch they use and yeah we're the magician <laughs> who lets you see all the tricks <laughs> yeah yeah for sure yeah. well the nice thing about puppetry is you can really just use anything around you you know any materials even just hot glue stuff you can get at the corner store but uh you know and, and when people want to take that next uh level uh or jump in their uh building career Changing of the materials can be that next big step to yeah, yeah, bringing yeah. up the quality of your work. Yeah. But, learning that, about it. but then again, yeah. just because you use the expensive materials doesn't mean you're going to necessarily <laughs> end up with a nice puppet either. Though. Very so true. Definitely that, Very that true. That's so true, actually. I um, I don't know if you saw on my Instagram, I had an audition this week where they were like, bring a puppet. And I didn't have anything appropriate. So I was like, I'm just going to make something quickly. So. I had no materials. I was in my flat making something. So I just used, I think I used like a cornflakes box and just some brown paper and newspaper and, and whipped up a quick kind of mock-up puppet. So it's really true. Yeah. yeah. But I wouldn't be sending that out to a, <laughs> to, to, to yeah. someone that's buying a, a puppet from me. But right. sometimes yeah. you've got to use what you got to use. And Sure. Well, and if, and if you're showing off your performance skills, there are really exactly. great puppeteers who could make that kind of thing work. So I've seen great puppeteers using like, pl like black plastic bags as a puppet and it's just amazing. So mm -hmm. well, even Hugo and Inez just using their body pretty much Absolutely. as puppetry. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, cool. Katie, thank you so much for joining us. It was such a pleasure to meet you and, and to hear about your work and please feel free to come back anytime because we'd love to 
keep talking and hearing from uh, see, seeing what your work is. Thanks Especially so if you have a me. cool project that you can talk about on. And yeah, just let us know. Yeah, definitely. All right. Wonderful. All right. Thank you for joining us on Thanks. Puppet Tears. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right. Bye. All right. Have a good one. Bye.